have you all back for another episode of Human Humane Architecture, broadcasting live from three locations today, Long Beach, California, on the little Hawaii, and near Munich, Germany. And uh, while we're all in um, post-pandemic projections and try to see what's next, um, we're sort of going with the flow of opening up a little bit, uh, hopefully carefully, and or for sure carefully. And so um, the, the, the challenge is obviously now uh, to find ways to proceed, especially on our island where our main economy has basically gone away, which is tourism. We are charged and we charge ourselves to look for how we vent ourselves. Uh, but in terms of uh, going ahead, we believe you should look back and see where you came from in order to uh, have a chance to move ahead. And in some ways, uh, the, the, the tourism industry um, has been invented in some, you know, to a large degree on our island uh, of Hawaii. And we want to talk about that today. So before we can reinvent it, we want to look back in how it got invented. And in order to do so, um, we can get the first slide up, please, because uh, one company that's uh, mostly related to hospitality worldwide is the Hilton Corporation. There's one in every city, including, as you see at the top right, in Munich. And their resort part, indeed, um, uh, there's strong ties to our island. And so the next slide um, is going to be... Um, clearing up a misconception because most tourists, as shown in the previous slide, associate Hilton with the Hilton Hawaiian Village. But that is actually not the case because that one was developed uh, by another very important person in the American uh, economy, Henry J. Kaiser, with the Kaiser Hawaiian Village that we see in the, in the background of the big picture. The foreground is a little confusing always, is a, is a is a neighboring development by Pete Wimberley um, and um, the Waikiki and, and the um, uh, Tahitian Lanai that many of us Polynesian pop pupils vividly remember. And Henry J. Kaiser sold that property to, um, to Conrad Hilton. So the, the Hilton beginnings of hospitality design on the island are somewhere else. For that, we uh, can go to the next slide, and we have the most perfect uh, uh, team members on uh, on the panel today, which is one uh, DeSoto Brown, Bishop Museum historian. Welcome, DeSoto. How do you do, and good morning, everybody. Yes, hello. Uh, and, we have, and we have back our friend Ron Lindgren from Long Beach, California, long-term friend and business partner of uh, the legendary Edward Killingsworth. And why don't, why don't you, Ron, kick in and explain, uh, you know, uh, along with slide three that we're on, uh, list the secret of how this all came about. Yeah, I might say in a preface, uh, the, we're, we're going to be dealing with the, uh, uh, the original Kahala Hilton Hotel, it was a very important structure. In some respects, it was the first international tropical destination resort, although in fact, it shares that honor with the wonderful Mauna Kea Beach Hotel. It's just that they, those two uh, examples of modern concrete architecture opened the same week in, in January of 1964, and the Kahala opened two days earlier, so it's the first. At the same time, it, uh, it's the finest and the most influential piece of work by my boss and mentor and friend, Ed Killing's work. Uh, what we're all, we're, we're all thinking about now is what might be the future of travel and tourism, and would a building like the uh, Kahala, which is now called the Kahala Hotel and Resort, how suitable is it for the pandemic and uh, post-pandemic days coming up? But I'm happy to know this very first uh, photo is very appropriate because it shows uh, Conrad Hilton, very charismatic hotelier, and he was celebrating with some Hawaiian aunties. I don't doubt that that was probably something that happened at the Kahala, um, maybe during uh, the opening. 
Uh, Hilton started his namesake hotel company during the very final years of the Second World War. And like any good hotelier, a successful hotelier, he brought style and glamour wherever he went. But especially when he was accompanied by his then wife, Zsa Gabor. <laughs> the, the reason that the original Carla Hilton uh, was even built was because of his continuing patronage of a Long Beach, California architect named Edward Tillingsworth. This patron first met Ed uh, in 1952 when Hilton had discovered the city of Long Beach, and he was remodeling uh, the premier sky room night spot in Long Beach, a very uh, upscale downtown penthouse restaurant and nightclub. It happened to uh, Phil as uh, the uh, designer and the project architect for his boss at that time. He wasn't working for himself yet until uh, eight years later, and that was the architect, Kenneth Wing. If we go to the next slide, there's, uh, Kenneth Wing was quite uh, successful and famous with very upscale, large homes and sometimes estates so in, in very affluent portions of, of Los Angeles. But interestingly enough, besides all of these expensive homes, he also designed the very first public housing project in Los Angeles. Uh, Ed worked for uh, Wing for eight years, becoming his uh, chief designer. And uh, as you can see on the, the top two pictures, that's an example of work that uh, Wing and Phillips worked, worked together. Uh, very comfortable, uh, elegant, Californian indoor outdoor living, uh, but it was still very traditional. And we got most ex most of his experience designing uh, traditional homes with sort of neo Georgian interiors. The end result of that was that he developed a real skill in, in doing really good proportions and having human scale in residential work. He managed to bring uh, Kenneth Wing kicking and streaming, uh, streaming into the modern world because the bottom photo shows the one modern house that still exists that Ed designed himself completely uh, in 1953 called the Sealy House. And it's uh, a flat roof post and beam structure with all of that glass looking out into extensive gardens. If we go to the next slide, in 1954, Hilton built his eighth hotel, his eighth company hotel in downtown Long Beach. And all of these early Hilton properties were urban, and at that time, none of them were identified as being from the Hilton company. Uh, Ed got involved in what was called the Lafayette Hotel, a very complicated mix of uh, remodeled existing mid-rise office buildings, turning them into guest rooms, a new, new low-rise guest rooms, as you see in the color photographs uh, uh, at the top, and then a very large ballroom over a parking structure. Uh, this was the venue for the televised Miss Universe contest uh, for many years. And Hilton was pleased with Ed's results, and, and as I quote, being elegant, innovative, functional, and labor-saving. And you can see the, the elegance is the architecture, but... Uh, Hilton is a businessman, so the innovation, the, the functionality, and how much it saved on labor was just as important, uh, and rightly so, as, as the, uh, the design itself. If we go to the next slide, uh, this satisfied client, Hilton, then asked Ed to design a prototype for a, new, a very new venture. It was going to be called the Hilton Motor Inns, and what Hilton had come to think of was that in his travel around the country, although he stayed generally in, in you know, the finest of hotels, uh, including some of his own, he really wanted to inject resort fun into roadside lodging. And, of course, that's completely missing from typically dreary motels. But uh, Hilton thought he would have a leg up if he could do uh, a modern hotel that was memorable. And it responded by... First of all, making sure that all of the buildings had very slim, modern lines. But Ed was also interested in the fact that every uh, building should be memorable when you arrive. Uh, and so, as you see in this uh, handsome watercolor, there's very large architectonic signage. So the 
sight could be seen from quite some distance away. And more importantly, below that signage was a memorable, very expensive port crochet. It was an entry pavilion of just posts and beams. And if you go to the next slide, once you got out from under the port crochet, instead of walking into a, a, a little narrow office, ringing the bell and having Norman Bates come up to uh, you know, tell you what your room is, instead you walk into this very bright, luminous, two-story post and beam structure with uh, some handsome traditional uh, chandeliers. And from there, uh, this view is shown back out to the parking lot, but a view uh, in the other direction would have shown what was awaiting the guest as resort fun, and that was a nicely landscaped garden courtyard uh, with the swimming pool. Yeah, and, and these are the uh, 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 references that, that earned the respect and the, the trust of Conrad Hilton, right? Yes, indeed. By this time, uh, if you go to the next slide, Ed had, had really proven his proficiency in handling the larger scale projects with some confidence and some artistry at the same time. Uh, Conrad Hilton felt entirely comfortable then in commissioning Ed's office to design what became a modern, career-making, full-service oceanfront hotel in the tropical paradise of Hawaii, where uh, the soda is, is enjoying now. Uh, and incidentally, Hilton felt that only modern architecture should be, uh, should be what hotels are, are built like. Because that best represented American success, power, and uh, technological uh, superiority. And the resultant the Holly Hilton Hotel for Ed became the source and lasting one for 37 successful years of hotel and resort design that, uh, that followed. In fact, 222 commissions for 37 uh, different countries. And that kept him uh, going so busy with the hospitality work that he uh, changed his whole practice to basically uh, zero in on hospitality design uh, for the rest of, his, uh, rest of his career. This is a view of the original Kahala site. And uh, what I might say about this a bit is the site was not uh, applicable uh, really for, for an international hotel, because it was basically 6.5 acres of just featureless scrub grass. And to make things even grow on this uh, on this site, they had to bring in 50,000 cubic yards of fill, topsoil, and lay it all over to enrich the grounds. Then the famous Hawaiian landscape architect, Wilbur Choi, planted 100 mature coconut palm trees there so that when the hotel was built, it would appear to have been uh, constructed within an existing old growth grove. Today, there wouldn't, uh, Kahala Hilton couldn't have been built because uh, very unsound ecological uh, mistakes would be called today had to be followed there to make a hotel that would be viable. Thousands of tons of sand had to be barged in from the island of Molokai to create. Uh, any kind of uh, 800, uh, it was about 1,800 foot long beach. And then you couldn't swim offshore, and so they had to dredge a lot of the existing coral, a uh, complete no no today, to provide a swimming area that got to a depth of about 10 feet. And then flanking this new beach, they built peninsulas of lava rock and topsoil to prevent the beach uh, from, erosion, uh, from eroding. That too, uh, is uh, pretty much illegal. And if I may also say, too, it made a very big impression on me when I was 10 years old that when the hotel opened, they had built a small fake island offshore, too, which is what you can see in this picture. And the idea that you could build your own little fake island, I thought, was incredibly intriguing and wonderful. Um, but again, <laughs> that's just a 10-year-old, and today you could not do that. If we look at the next slide, yes, uh, yes uh, please, Martin. I'll go ahead with the yep. next slide. Exactly. Yeah, if we go to the next slide, we'll see what looks as if it might have been uh, some sort of advertisement. Uh, 
it's the uh, it's the shape of the island of Oahu, and someone has selected uh, some high highlights of the uh, of what's at the island, including the North Shore, several hotels. I, when you look at the bottom right of the uh, Oahu, it almost looks like Kahala is very close to Waikiki, maybe just a few minutes walk away. One of the concerns that uh, Hilton's uh, seconds in command and, and other people who were in charge of uh, finance was that it was perhaps way too remote. It was way too much of a gamble from where the action was beginning to happen in Waikiki now that there was uh, jet flights and uh, and that continued to be a concern uh, all through the planning of the hotel itself. The, and the in fact, slide, it was too far away, and that's something we will get to as we, we talk further, the fact that in its first years, it didn't get enough tourists because it wasn't in Waikiki, and it was not within walking distance. And they actually ran two small shuttle buses between the hotel and Waikiki to make people think it wasn't quite as inconvenient but after a while, people said, oh, no, do we actually like it being out there? And uh, <laughs> things took off. But it took a while. Yeah, the, the, yeah. the island was moving along those early years. The, uh, the hotel would look like it looks now in the pandemic. That's right. how right. unpopular <laughs> the hotel unpopular was. It was. But, but let's go to the next slide because you've got something that Ed did. You're going to talk about something that Ed did that was really remarkable for this hotel and made a difference. Yeah, I'm, I'm holding back from any sort of glimpses ahead of what the hotel, in essence, really looked like. In other words, the macro version of the hotel. But uh, one of the most important things that uh, the hotel held was the result of Ed's own mastery of residential architecture. Not only had he spent those eight years with uh, uh, Kenneth Wing on very expensive traditional homes, but then he had contributed, enriched, and formed very iconic Southern California mid-century modern architecture and was, in fact, the architect who provided more designs for case study houses in the pages of Arts and Architecture magazine. But first, what you see on the, on the right-hand side of the photo is what the interior designers uh, managed to accomplish within this modern building. Uh, what was wonderful at the time was that the, the two chief uh, modern uh, interior designers were actually architects from Seattle, Washington, Bob Egan and Roland Terry. And you can see that they've created, it's very much in the 1960s modern idiom, but there are plenty of touches of Hawaiiana which warmed it up and brought a sense of place. But what Ed provided on the left were absolutely revolutionary guest in the plans. Now, almost everyone who goes to a hotel, motel, they open the front door, and it's a long, narrow courtyard. And, uh, and way at the end of the, of, the, of the room, there's some light from a window or, or maybe a sliding door. But in this case, the guest room modules were so wide that, uh, in fact, they were wider than deep. And so there wasn't that feeling of... Uh, of, of narrowness and of, of constriction. And uh, you can see how the furniture arranges very nicely uh, and very, very spaciously. And this meant that the, the wonderful tropical sunlight and the moonlight on a full moon, which is a gorgeous sight to see, could come into the room fully all the way to the back wall. The back wall is the wall of a, a very revolutionary bathroom as far as tropical hotels. Ed put together a his and hers bathroom so that uh, they really wouldn't get in each other's way when they were bathing or primping or preparing whatever they were doing before heading downstairs to the Monterey Resting. Uh, Ed, this wasn't a new invention because Ed, Ed loved the Waldorf Astoria in New York. He often stayed in a suite which had a his and her arrangement. But in my research, I think it is, in fact, the first time but this very humane and practical uh, elegance of his and her bath appeared in any tropical hotel in the world. That's very likely. I think you're right. Let's go to, we've got another picture here that just sort of is a general ambience of the 
wonderful setting of the Kahala Hilton after it had it well, all. And, that's, and that's, that's your favorite. And that's your favorite child of Treasure Island, Soto, right? That's right. That's right. That's right. And, and you can see and, what it and, looked like with its talking, new beach, etc. And talking treasures. While we move on, I just want to say that what we will see is comprised of a beautiful collection of both uh, mental and physical archival treasures from, from both of you. Uh, the pictures from many of your presentations, Ron, and then um, the, the brochures, the marketing brochures from, from your personal and your Bishop Museum archives. Uh, I really Correct. look forward to that. Correct. And I want to yes. and I want to say, Ron, I really appreciate the educator and me. I really appreciate, and that's why we have set up the, the narrative that way, logically, that the hotel was designed inside out. It has a very intriguing form that we will slowly but surely get to. But it's important that it was designed from what you had just explained in the very true modern tradition of not making fetishized objects, but making architecture that justifies itself from inside out. So thanks right. for. Uh, right. explaining that to us. Right. And, and in now, fact, before we get before we get to all that, as we look at this uh, wonderful sunrise with Coco Head off to the left, uh, this, there, there's a little little history to talk about. You have to imagine that back in 1795, mm -hmm. somewhere along the Kahala Sewers, it's been estimated that some 16,000 uh, warriors landed their canoes there as an invading military force. And, of course, they were led by the great chief Kamehameha, who thus conquered Oahu. At that time, Oahu was the sixth of, of eight populated islands in the chain. And by his conquering Oahu, he established what would be known then for the next century as the Kingdom of Hawaii. Correct. Now, many years later, in 1947, the descendants of Kamehameha, many of whom uh, served on the board of the Bishop of State Lands, were considering what to do with their lands, their, their wonderful property out in the uh, Kahala Wailea area. And uh, some people thought it was best to take an existing golf course that was there and completely subdivide it. In other words, make a new community there and get rid of the golf course. There'd be homes, a park, school, shopping center, on that sort of acreage. But others urged that the estate leave the golf course as it was and then retain those very gracious house lots along Kahala Beach and build what they termed superior homes on the, perimeter, uh, on the periphery of the golf greens. And additionally, it was suggested that a beach site be developed there for a world-class hotel, the idea being to enhance and maintain the exclusive character and ambience of this uh, neighborhood. Uh, this later uh, advice, his latter advice, was actually what the Bishop State Trustees chose to follow. And then we jump to 1960 when a local Hawaiian developer, Charles Peach, who was born and raised in the nearby Kamuki district, managed to obtain a 1960 lease on 12 acres of what had been uh, a part of the golf course to build a luxury hotel, but also to build some condominiums next to it. With his lease in hand, Peach then flew off to Los Angeles and put together a financial package with his friend, Conrad Hilton. Uh, interestingly, Conrad put some of his company's money in and some of his personal money in. And there were many other investors, including, as DeSoto uh, well knows, some of his relatives. Yes. My uncle was one of them. And uh, that, uh, Check out the article and go to the next slide. Oh, yeah. yeah uh, the next slide... Uh, again, although I'm holding back on showing uh, what the hotel really looked like, a very famous architectural photographer, perhaps the finest one in, in the United States, Julie Shulman, took many, many photos of the hotel. He was entranced by it. And when you first look at this photo on the left, it's a little hard to know what it is. He's looking down through some structure, which we'll talk about soon. Uh, but it looks very interesting, to say the least, architecturally. To the right, is one of the uh, Soto's treasures, uh, an, an early brochure uh, before the hotel opened, I would think. Yes. Uh, uh, introducing the Gala Hilton to the public. Correct. And this beautiful woman happens to have a, uh, a sort of symbolic heliconia uh, plant uh, that is printed over her lovely Hawaiian dress. 
Yeah, and that actually is the logo of the hotel. The Heliconia flower. Yes. And if we have time for the, the uh, next slide, uh, this is the site plan of the hotel. I promise next week we're going to see what the hotel looks like to, for those viewers who haven't been there, because it is, as I, I promise, uh, a site worth waiting for. As you can see here uh, that there were two guest room wings planted uh, askew from each other a bit and roughly parallel to the beach. This meant that the people on the south side had direct ocean views. The people on the back side actually had some handsome views, but they were across the Wailau Golf Course to the verdant Ko'olau Mountains. And many people have asked over the years, why didn't Ed just simply turn the guest rooms perpendicular to the beach so that everyone who came to the hotel actually got both those views, even though they would be oblique views? But the, the reason that happened was that this was not early 1960s, and the Pahala's air conditioning system was one of the very first major installations of its type. But at that time, if those rooms had been turned perpendicular to the ocean, they would have been facing due east and due west. The guest rooms would have been facing that way. And the air conditioning systems at that time just could not uh, bear up to that kind of uh, exposure. And, and you can also the, uh, see in this you can also see yes. in this view that there's a big lagoon. You can see the ocean and the beach, but you can also see the lagoon which the hotel projects out into, as well as the entryway, which you said is a very important part of any Hilton hotel coming in on the left. And um this is also really crucial to how you see it and how you experience it when you first get there. Which we're so eager to see more. The only problem is we ran out of time, but um, I can <laughs> listen to you guys forever. So I will continue to do that. Just take a little break of the week, and then we're going to be back with uh, more of this here. And uh, thank you guys so much for sharing this exciting story of a project that uh, we probably all know on the island and hopefully in the world. Many know, most likely, but. Yeah. The story behind, we didn't. So thanks for shedding a light on that. And until then, uh, please stay uh, tropically, exotically easy breezy, which we increasingly know is the best we can do in these days. And we're privileged to have that uh, in more, um, you know, tropical climate. So Ron and DeSoto, thank you very much. And uh, I'm, I can't wait to hear the rest of the story next week. Okay, bye. Keep safe. Bye-bye, guys.